Today's episode is all about the Israeli Army's historic 556 Galil, which was their main combat rifle between 1972 and 2000. So why is it known as one of the world's most beloved AK variants ever made? Well, for starters, it was a gun that had its priorities straight, with an integrated steel bottle opener manufactured directly into it, because everyone knows doing war sober is the worst. Now I'm jealous the American M4 doesn't have a rip-it opener on it. In order to truly understand this weapon, let's get out of the studio and actually put some rounds through it. The Galil tried to combine the best aspects of Western ammo and Eastern firearms philosophy into one very good looking package. The one I'm holding here is an older model Galil. It had a long 18 inch barrel for added accuracy. One thing that hasn't changed since its creation is that it's always featured a full send mode with a high rate of fire at 650 rounds per minute. I was able to dump the entire mag faster than I could say Shalom. That means hello. The rifle has evolved over the years from originally having a wooden foregrip and a carrying handle to its modern upgraded Galil Ace version made with polymer and a Picatinny rail system that we're going to get into later. The future version coming out soon is an NFT of a cat firing it. Don't screenshot that, I digitally own it. It's still in use to this day as the primary rifle in Estonia and the Colombian military. It's just not in use by the IDF anymore, which is weird, right? So why did Israel decide to go through the trouble of creating their own weapon if they don't even use it anymore? The Galil has a fascinating rise and fall story that tells us as much about the military history of Israel as it does about the development of small arms in general. The IDF basically married an AK-47 to the M16 here, to which I say mazel tov. I always knew those two would be good together if they ever stopped fighting. But it did have some downsides, like it's noticeably two pounds heavier than the AK. But there's a good reason for that. The real reason the Galil was much heavier was because its receiver was forge milled instead of stamped. IWI also has a closer machining tolerance, which means that the margin of error on the parts is lower at their factory. So that adds to the cost as well. On the plus side, it also makes the Galil way more accurate than the Soviet AK. The reason they used this more expensive forged mill production method was because they saw the original AK-47s were being made using a sheet metal stamping technology that made the weapon lighter, but created serious issues in the field with parts breaking. One of the distinguishing features that you'll notice right away on the weapon is its long curved magazine that it's often seen with. I think this comes from the IDF's dislike for their old FAL, which could only carry 20 rounds. And you'll see a lot of design choices in the Galil are a direct consequence of the bad taste left in their mouth after the FAL. Look, I'm all for having more ammo. But can we agree that the IDF's 50 round mags were a little bit too long? Where do we draw the line? Soldiers even reported having trouble hitting their targets with these things. This was one of the first military weapons adopted to fire the accurate small NATO 556 from the reliable AK-47 style action. The AR Galil has an impressive muzzle velocity of 950 meters per second and an extended max range of 500 meters. You have to remember at the time of its development in the late 1960s, the Glil was a very novel idea. If you think about it, two years after it went into service, the Soviet army made a version of the AK that fired a small round that was very similar to the Glil. It also had a foldable stock just like the Glil. Coincidence? Maybe. But I think that the Israelis were inspired by the Soviet AK, who were then inspired by the Israeli Galil. Isn't the circle of firearms life fascinating? So how does the Galil work? When fired, the high pressure gases from the explosion of the gunpowder are evacuated into the gas cylinder, which drives the piston rod rearward. As the bolt carrier flies backwards, this in turn compresses the return spring, and that return energy contained inside the spring sends the assembly back forward, which then strips a new round from the magazine. This all happens in a fraction of a second, and the whole process creates what's called recoil, which I'm known for getting tossed around by. Seriously, it looks like these firearms are handling me. So in 1955, Israel adopted the FNFAL, which was all the rage with NATO at the time. In the Six Days War of 1967, the FAL turned out to be a huge disappointment for Israel. So you have to remember the brand new IDF wasn't very well trained or equipped to correctly maintain the FAL in the field. Guys, can we pause the war real quick? Time out. I got a grain of sand jammed in my gun. It's not working. They would even try to use the enemy's captured AK-47s instead. Israeli soldiers gave the feared AK a majestic nickname, the Tiger of the Desert, which was similar to the nickname that the enemy gave me in Iraq the kitten of the sandbox. Israel knew it would be hard for them to acquire the AK straight from the Soviet Union at the time, since they were just starting to get buddy-buddy with NATO. 
So they turned to their internal state-run weapons production company, IMI, to create a solution. Yezreel Balashnikov headed up the design team working on what would become the Galil. He was born in 1923 in the Soviet Union of all places. At a very early age, he moved to Israel, where he served with the British Army during World War II, and his job couldn't have been more relevant. He would steal weapons from the enemy in order to give it to the Allies to use. After the war, he helped develop the Uzi at IMI. The whole point of his Galil was that it needed to work in the desert without fail, unlike the finicky FAL. It was supposed to solve all of their problems. Maybe not all of them, I hear there's a Nobel Peace Prize up for grabs, whoever figures that out. They also liked the advantages offered by the lighter 5.56 round because they felt it was a more accurate cartridge and allowed for additional rounds in the magazine when compared to the 7.62. I think the Galil even borrowed some design features from the FNFAL, like the shape of its carrying handle. The distinct rectangular shaped wooden foregrip was a uniquely Israeli design aesthetic. It was Balashnikov putting his signature on the rifle. When making the prototype for the weapon, he studied captured AK-47s and borrowed its reliable long stroke rotating bolt design. He didn't like the way the AKs were stamp manufactured though, so when he heard about the Finnish Army's improved Valmat RK-62, he wanted to know how they made that. Israel secured the rights to make the first Galil prototypes using the Finnish Valmat machinery and blueprints. So at this point in its early development in the 1970s, the prototype Galil was still named after the firearm engineer's original name, the Balashnikov rifle. I can imagine that name did not go over well with the focus groups because of its coincidence of sounding too much like Kalashnikov. Nice to meet you, Yisrael Balashnikov. We love your prototype Balashnikov rifle. It's just perfect. We think you're a creative genius. Keep up the great work, don't change a bit. But also, do you think you could just, I don't know, completely change your name. We ran some focus groups and we found that the name Balashnikov wasn't really sitting well with the 25 to 35 demo. That means demographic. And people in our 45 to 65 demo think Balashnikov sounds way too much like Kalashnikov. And just hearing the word really triggers them. Basically, the IDF really didn't want their new primary weapon to sound like it was being supplied from the Soviet Union, which is understandable. And it just so happened that Yisrael Balashnikov wanted to change his name to something that reflected his new life in Israel anyway. So he changed his name to the location of his new hometown, Galili. Wait, so are you saying that the Galil is basically just a carbon copy of the AK-47? Is my whole life a lie? The whole time I was just a fan of the AK-47, not the Galil? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. Sometimes in firearms development, being able to come up with a way to manufacture at scale and being able to make small changes can make all the difference. The changes that differentiate the Galil from the AK are where it gets really interesting. You see, one of the most visually unique aspects of the Galil, and the easiest way to tell it apart from an AK, just at a glance, is its charging handle. It's angled up and it extends above the receiver, which makes it intuitive to operate with your left hand while keeping your right hand on the pistol grip. The bottle opener located near the magazine port was apparently added because soldiers were frequently damaging their Uzi magazines by using them to open bottles. How lucky is the IDF that they get to crack open a cold one in the field? When I was deployed to Iraq, everyone in the US military had to drink fake near beers just to feel alive for a minute. Stay hydrated, huh? But manufacturing the Galil was delayed by the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. When it finally reached the soldiers' hands just in time for 1975, that's when the USA's war in Vietnam was coming to a close. The US military at the time was looking to get rid of a ton of surplus M16s, so they started selling them to Israel at a very cheap cost. So cheap that it was much more cost effective for the IDF to buy M16s instead of mass producing the relatively expensive Galil. Hey Spare Parts Army, please remember to hit the like button. The one thing I didn't like when shooting it was that the bolt doesn't stay open to the rear after the last shot. I also found myself confused when looking at the fire selector switch. It has three letters, S, A, and R. At first, I had no idea what the R stood for. Does it stand for reverse? Can I shoot this gun like in Tenant? A range safety officer at the Heritage Guild was kind enough to inform me that it actually is British terminology, which stands for repetition, which means single fire in American. I'm not as familiar with the AK style selector switch, so personally, I found it difficult to know for sure which firing mode I was on at any time. It's hard to feel the difference because the increment between each firing selector is very small. By the year 2000, the Israeli Defense Forces had completely phased out the Galil in favor of the M16, and then they moved on to their own Taver bullpup. Just when you thought the Galil was dead, IWI resurrected it and this upgraded version tried to fix all of the complaints that were leveled against its grandpa. 
The whole thing is about a pound or two lighter at 7.9 pounds or 3.6 kilograms. This is thanks to its receiver now being made out of a mix of lightweight polymer and steel. It's got an increased rate of fire at 880 rounds per minute, and the new Galil loses some of its visually distinguishing trademarks in favor of practicality, so now it has a simple left side charging handle. They added a Picatinny rail system, as is tradition, and they even fixed my pet peeves of adding a last round bolt catch. The Galil Ace has already been adopted by the People's Army of Vietnam as their primary weapon. The Galil and the Uzi put the Israeli weapons industry on the map and proved that Israel had some talented weapons designers. It did have some original problems that have since been addressed with its recent upgraded Ace version, which seems to show that the Galil will continue to have a promising future in the military. Thank you for watching. Happy New Year's, guys. I'm excited to show you about what we have in store for you next year, like a consistent posting schedule. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. If you get a chance, please check out this video here that I made about the US Navy SEALs versus the Green Berets. I think you guys will like it.